So, take your Bibles and uh, turn to uh, Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> Does anybody need a Bible? Acts chapter 13. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how can the pastor find another message out of chapter 13? <laughs> this is the fourth message just on chapter 13 alone. I'm not sure that you realize that. <coughs> One of the things that um, what happens is when, when chapter 13 and 14 is the narrative of the first missionary journey. And, and what happens is often when we read the narrative of the missionary journey, sometimes we forget that these narratives are actually about, um, about Christian witnesses, Christians who are being witnesses, just living their lives for the king. Okay, they're just living their lives for the king. We're, we're often tempted to think that these missionary narratives are only about missionaries. Uh, and in fact, the missionary organizations go to these chapters to, to build principles about uh, missions and, and going to the foreign field and, and all of these, these things. And, and so we as normal Christians, normal Christians, <laughs> uh, we tend to think that, well, there's nothing really for us to get out of this. Because it's not talking about us, it's talking about missionaries. And extraordinary missionaries at that. I mean, how many missionaries would say that they were in the same class as Paul and Barnabas? <coughs> and, and, it, and it's true that Paul and Barnabas, and, and even Mark, initially here, um, and the other missionaries, they did specifically go from village to village and town to town and city to, to city to spread the gospel. So in that sense, we call them missionaries and foreign missionaries to that extent. But the majority of the Christians, even in the early church, because we know now, we know that just from Jerusalem alone, that there was in excess of, of 30 to 50,000 believers. And now this is still several years later that the, the church is very large. And these, the majority of the church, these ordinary Christians, they stayed at home. All these missionary journey passages <coughs> do is focus on the ministry of two or three different people. But the thing that we need to realize is that those who stayed at home were no less missionaries than Paul and Barnabas. In fact, it is when we think that a missionary is some kind of super Christian with the call of God on him who goes out into enemy territory to face the not demonic forces and the rest of the Christians just stay home and they give their money and they pray, that's when we lose sight of the fact that ordinary Christians also face the enemy and that ordinary Christians are also called by God and ordinary Christians are not exempt from being witnesses of the gospel. If we are all missionaries, then we would reach, if we were all missionaries, in, in terms of our definition of going <clears throat> away from home, if we did that, then who's going to reach our loved ones with the gospel? Who's going to reach our, our friends with the gospel? Who, who's going to reach our schoolmates or, or the people that we work with? Right? We all go into enemy territory. It is just that some of us leave home to do it. So my, my point is this, that everything that Paul and Barnabas encountered as missionaries leaving their home, every other Christian, you and I included, encountered the exact same thing. So I want you to remember this. The missionary did not reach every person in the cities that they went to. They didn't reach every person in the cities that they went to. In fact, we're going to discover as we go through through 13 and 14, that when Paul returned to the same cities, he found that there were more Christians than when he had left. 
So the question is, who witnessed to them? <clears throat> so there are many lessons here that apply to each of us equally. Now, I subscribe to a, a magazine called Modern Reformation. <clears throat> and uh, I just got my November, December issue came in this week. <laughs> Keep some calm. I, I want to be calm. <laughs> okay. Anyways, in this uh, in this in the magazine, there was an article by a, a man by the name of Blake Hartong. I think that's how you pronounce it. And, and this article was called "Back to the Future." And what he was doing it was actually comparing our modern situation as Christians in North America to the situation of the early church in the first century, which is where we are in Acts chapter 13. And he writes, he says this, Today, for the first time since antiquity, Western Christians inhabit a largely non-Christian society. Now, we, that's what the Christians in the first century in Acts 13 encountered, right? It was largely a non-Christian society. So we have that in common. He continues, For most of us, these changes take the form not of aggressive persecutions, but of subtle social pressures. Okay? Uh, things like regular church attendance, where in our parents' generation, even in my generation, uh, most people went to church. But today, people don't go to church. And, and, and when they find out you go to church, they kind of look at you funny, don't they? Okay? Uh, our, our society no longer... Um, understands us and they mock our theology and especially our moral beliefs. Beliefs that were once held in high esteem in our society. The, the beliefs of secular humanism and political correctness, they, they now shape our society. Uh, they, 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 they determine what is tolerant and what is not. And Christianity to our society today is seen as in opposition to society. And it's in opposition because of the exclusivity of our message and of, the, of our ethics, of our morals. Of what is sin and what isn't. Our society believes that Christianity goes against a, a collection of social practices that are believed to promote social cohesion, is what the author says. And we see that, right? You, if we don't believe the same thing about, about homosexuality, then they say you're going against the norm. These new social norms define us as Canadians, and they function as economic engines that promote finance and industry. That's no different to what Paul and Barnabas and the early church had in the first century. In the Roman society, that had specific, and we, call them, we can call them religious um, norms that established how they function as a society. Uh, it was the same way with the Jews. In the Jewish communities that the early church encountered, in the first century, those those Jews had religious practices. They had their ceremonies. They had their uh, um, their um, their feasts. They had all of the different things that they did. The, the way they dressed, everything dictated what their community was all about. All you got to do is watch the movie um, tradition. What's the what is it? Fiddler on the roof. Thank you. Fiddler on the roof, and you see that. That, that it was, their community was defined by their religious norms. And, and that drove their community, uh, <clears throat> their identity and their very existence. And even the people of Athens and the people of Rome, they were all driven by a social and re religiosity of the diversity of the people. Uh, let's just take a look at one of them quickly. Turn to uh, chapter 16 of Acts, uh, verse 17 and following. This is when Paul comes to Philippi um, and uh, he gives the gospel, but 
there's a demon girl, or a girl, not a demon girl, a girl that is, <laughs> like a girl that is possessed by a demon. And uh, she's really bothering Paul, and, and so he cast the demon out of her. But look at verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 19. Look at what it says. When the owners saw that their hope of gain, okay, that's financial gain he's talking about, so that's, that's a society thing, right? When it was the hope of their gain was gone, forget about the religious aspect of it, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are, what's the next word? Disturbing, Disturbing our city. Places are throwing their city into an uproar. Yeah, throw, yeah, throw the city in an uproar. Disturbing the city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Mm -hmm. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods, and they put them in prison. You see, the, the problem was not Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The problem was the challenge to what society believed. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we have today. Mm -hmm. So coming back to chapter 13, we find Paul and Barnabas at the beginning of the chapter. Um, uh, well, halfway through the ministry, rather, they go to Antioch in Pisidia. And, and I want you to notice there that, that it was not until the Jews saw the crowds responding to the masses that the missionaries encountered any trouble. Look at verse 45. Verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowd, the Jews there would be the Jewish leaders of the synagogue. When they saw the crowds, uh, as they were responding to Paul, they were filled with what? Jealousy. With jealousy. What could they possibly be jealous of? It's not the gospel. It's not Jesus Christ. The popularity. It's the attention and the popularity, exactly. Because what was it's happening is, it was throwing their society into an uproar. And what, what it continues is, and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. So in other words, they had to say, say, you're intolerant. You, you, you don't know the truth. Your, your morality is, is just dumb. You've got to, you know, exactly the same things that our society is saying to us today. So it's nothing new then, is that? It's mm -hmm. nothing new. Mm -hmm. It was not so much the message of Jesus as it was that the message was upsetting the religious norm of their society and of their lifestyle and of their Jewish community. Now, contrary to popular belief, and maybe you, you at one time were thinking of this, and hopefully you're not anymore because of our time spent in, in Acts, but contrary to popular thinking, most Christians of the first century never faced the lions. Okay? They weren't thrown into the lions' dens. They were they weren't burned at the stake. Now, um, some of it happened for a brief period of time in the latter part of the 60s, but all of this in Acts is all prior to that. They weren't burned at the stake. They weren't nailed to crosses and crucified. Um, Yet all of them, coming back to Hartman's article, he says, yet all of them had to constantly negotiate how to live and participate in a society that was opposed to, perplexed by, or indifferent toward them. And that's what we experience, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're not <laughs> crucified, burned in the state. So we can identify with what is happening. So the challenges we face today are no different from the challenges of the early church and its missionaries. Because Christians refuse to participate in local, civic, or cultural, culturally ethnic, religious ceremonies. They were by definition exclusive and thereby offensive to the pagan pluralism that bound the Roman Empire together. And, you know, and, and we face this all the time. Again, our, our, our time spent um, with the Sydney Church, um, 
on two different occasions. We were, we encountered, at least I encountered at, at my level, at the leadership level, um, the um, ecumenicalism that all religions need to cooperate together. And that was pressure on, on us as evangelicals. That we are to abandon our belief in that God is the only God and that we have the exclusive rights to the gospel and accept every religion as possibly having some truth and therefore we should appear in unity. <coughs> so what do I look like? And I say, no, I'm not participating. <laughs> you think you're better than us. You're intolerant. You're, you're, you're <laughs> divisive. Exactly right. <laughs> you okay, birthday girl? The challenge for us, as it was for Paul and Barnabas and the other Christians, is how do we effectively engage our friends and our neighbors, and how do we effectively engage the intellectual arguments that are out there of our age, while at the same time remaining faithful to our beliefs and to our convictions. How do, we, how do we effectively reach our community and answer all of their objections against us and yet remain faithful to what we believe and, what we are, and, and to our convictions? That's our challenge. And that's the exact same challenge that Paul and Barnabas had in the other Christians. We, we can become overwhelmed with the intellectual debates of scientists and atheists and and, and we can be forced to retreat when we hear of Christian businesses being taken to court and fined for taking a stand on moral issues. They can cause us to retreat. But is that what we are to do? And when we look at these first century Christians, the first thing we see is that even though they are frequently misunderstood just as we are misunderstood, the first thing is they did not retreat into their own communities. Cults do that. They isolate themselves from the rest of society. They, they did not retreat into their own communities. And secondly, they did defend themselves. In Athens, Paul stood bef before the whole secular community and defended his belief. And they engaged their critics. And thirdly, they made sure that they knew what they believed. In fact, the experiences of the first century church um, caused the second century church to write down specifically what they believed. That's where we got get all of our, our, um, uh, our major teaching. They dealt with the issue of, of the sovereignty of God, of the humanity of Jesus, of, of the deity of Christ, and all of those difficult things that came out of this that they needed to know what they believe. <clears throat> we need to remember that our faith is intellectually defendable. Okay? It, it is. Now, the thing that we have today is we can, when uh, people give us certain arguments, we don't need to know the, the arguments because we have a lot of YouTube videos of debates between really smart and intelligent Christian leaders uh, that uh, can certainly uh, send to those kind of people. So you don't need to know that. We have that advantage that the first century church did not have. So the early church reminds us that the greatest way to engage our non-Christian world and to remain faithful to the gospel is to deepen our commitment to not only our belief, but to our love for one another. Uh, and that's one of the, the things when, when you look at a lot of the writings that, uh, uh, that came out of that period of time by Roman um, leaders, when they talk about Christians, they always talk about their love for one another. And so we need that. This is what made the early church's message attractive and believable. And this is how the king was able to build his kingdom through his witnesses.
So I, we're going to quickly go through um, chapter 13 and 14, and I, I'm going to highlight a, a few things here that hopefully will help us in, in terms of, of how we need to live our lives, not as missionaries, but as witnesses for the king. That's what we are. And even in these chapters, Paul and Barnabas were not called missionaries. Remember that. So in verse 4, look at verse 4. It's, we, we read there that they were being sent out by who? The Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Okay? It was clear that where their orders came from. They were both divinely enabled and commissioned by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> you and I and every other Christian are equally enabled by the Holy Spirit and directly commissioned by the King Himself. Through Matthew 28, 19, right? The Great Commission. The only difference between Paul and Barnabas and you and I is that they were also sent off by the church and were acknowledged for their remarkable willingness uh, to bravely follow God into new territories. That's the only difference. And sometimes I think when I read this that, that maybe we should have a commission service every single time somebody becomes a Christian. Let's now commission them as witnesses for, for the king. Because that's what we are. And, and, and that's what verse 3 tells us, isn't it? So as they set sail then from, for Cyprus, King Jesus was the captain of their ship in exactly the same way that he is the general of his troops, which is you and I. Paul and Barnabas were not the masters of their journey any more than you and I are masters of our journey. We all serve our Lord and King Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? Yeah. He alone is building his kingdom, and he's using all of us to accomplish it. <clears throat> so as Paul and Barnabas and Mark, they set sail out of Seleucia, which is the port city of Antioch, uh, verse 4, uh, towards Cyprus, they were, they were the king's ambassadors. They were the witnesses. And that's how I want you to think of it, because that's what Jesus said in Acts 1 8. You will be my witnesses. He didn't say you'll be my missionaries. Right? And we, we've got to get this concept back into our minds, that they were witnesses, we are witnesses, there is no difference. Okay? Uh, they were witnesses, and when you and I leave this assembly here, when we gather together, Okay? And we leave our homes and we go to work or we go to school or we visit them, save friends and family. There is no difference between us and what Paul and Barnabas were doing. We are all ambassadors for the King. The Spirit never left them and was constantly leading them. And the Holy Spirit never leaves you and He is constantly leading you in the same way. In verse 5 then, we see that their, their trip was well planned. Okay, it was well planned. They, they would leave Antioch from the seaport of Seleucia, and they set sail for Salamis, the port city of the island of Cyprus. And when they got there, the plan was a simple one. They would travel the island from east to west, from Salamis to Paphos, preaching the gospel, first in the Jewish synagogues to the Jews and the devout Gentiles. That was their plan, and that's what they did. Evangelism doesn't have to be complicated. And I, I really think that, that the church through the 70s, when we came up with all of these evangelism methods, that we destroyed evangelism. Because... <clears throat> What we did is we institutionalized giving up, t sharing the gospel into a program that you've got to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, with steps and illustrations and pat phrases you've got to learn and, and methods of dealing with objections and all this stuff. <coughs> and so we go into courses to learn how to evangelize and then we go out there and we do things and all of us are filled with fear because we don't know if we have the confidence of the method. It was never meant to be that way. Evangelism is just sharing the gospel. We need a simple plan. And the simple plan is this. Get the gospel into the hands of people. 
they, they had a plan of how they were going to do that. But that was the simplicity of their evangelism. Get the gospel there. To them, the easiest way was to go to the synagogues first. Because the Jews who were near the gospel and the devout Gentiles who were near the gospel were there. And from there, they can then reach out to the pagan Gentiles who were far from the gospel. And God can build his church. But the only thing they went with was the gospel. <clears throat> and the easiest way for us to do, which they didn't have, is, is we have the printed page. And uh, uh, we certainly can speak it by word of mouth, with the way they did. But we also can use gospel <coughs> tracts. And I am in the process of, of either finding or writing a gospel Track that is simply the gospel. Yes. I have found it very difficult in my searching to find a printed track that sticks to the gospel. It always goes off into political sideways yes. issues. And it doesn't accomplish its purpose. Anyways, that's an aside. So now when we come to verses 6 to 8, we, we find that the trio came to the capital of the island, to, to Paphos. And they encountered two men. <clears throat> One was the, the Roman governor of Cyprus, whose name was Sergius Paulus. And uh, they have, archaeology has discovered documents uh, that name him. So again, uh, approving the scriptures. And Luke describes him in verse 7 as a man of intelligence. Um, uh, and the other person that we encounter is the wizard or the magician Elimas, also known as Bar Jesus. Bar Jesus means son of Jesus, and it's thought that maybe he went around proclaiming that he might have been some incarnate uh, version of Jesus, or that he was some kind of a spiritual uh, relative and had the salvation message. <clears throat> By these verses, we can conclude that Sergius was actually disillusioned. Uh, with the pagan materialism uh, of the Roman society, and that he was seeking the things that he thought the God of the Jews would offer him. Uh, Elimas, the magician, was claiming to know the way of salvation, but in verses 9 and 10, Paul accuses him of being a false teacher. This is what Mary was talking about. Some false teachers are outside of the church and are very easy to identify, the majority of false teachers are within their, the church community and actually call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, are misguided Christians, mm -hmm. but their message is still false nonetheless. <laughs> and, and here's the, the thing, that there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who are looking for what God has to offer and not God himself, like Sergius. Okay, remember Romans 3.11, it tells us that no one seeks after God. No one seeks after God. Okay. They might think that they'll say things like, I'm trying to find truth, I'm, I'm trying to find meaning to life. These are things that God can offer. They're not really seeking God. They want some kind of religious experience, or, or they're looking for the Christian culture. Uh, this is very popular, in particular since... Um, <laughs> oh, you okay, Caleb? Particularly since the, um, um, the days of the of seeker-sensitive movement, trying to make the Christian culture attract the world. Well, they come for the culture. They didn't come for God or the message. And some of them, God is preparing for the truth of the gospel, but almost all of them are attracted to the false teaching. We're going to remember that. So now Sergius believed, we see here, and he believed because Paul gave him the gospel and God confirmed the message by making Elimus blind. He doesn't always do that with us these days because the gospel message is, is sufficient in itself. Paul and Barnabas didn't know what to expect when they started out 
on their journey to pay to um, to the island. And in fact, the first part of their journey on the island went really well, all the way from the the east ports to the west ports went great. But then they met the opposition in Ilimas. And again, here, here's the lesson I think: if you never share your faith, you will never look like a fool. If you never stand for righteousness on social issues, you will never be rejected. If you never walk out of a theater because a movie or a play is offensive, you will never be called prudent. If you never give your heart, it will never be broken. If you never go to Cyprus, you will never face the false teachers of the devil. And you will never know the joy of seeing Sergius come to faith in Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? In, uh, in verse 13 and 14, it tells us that they continued on to Pergia, they went in, inland, and they came to Antioch and Pisidia. Once you, um, once you witnessed in Cyprus, then you've got to move on to Antioch. So once you've given the gospel to one person, you move on and give the gospel to another person. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Living the Christian life and being a witness is just giving the gospel to as many people as we can. And moving from one person to the other. Um, <clears throat> you, you keep going. You give a track here, you give a track there. Talk to this person, you talk to the next person. You, you, you don't have to stay and argue with people. You give the gospel, you move on. And the rest of chapter 13 is actually Paul's sermon that he gives at the, uh, in the synagogue there at Antioch. Um, and he's speaking to Jews, so he connects their history to Christ and to the fulfillment of the promises. That's pretty um, meaningful to a Jewish audience, so that they can see that Christ is the Messiah that they have been longing for ever since the days of Abraham. <clears throat> the gospel does have to relate to the audience. So in our society, just as in the first century society, there are two people, which I've already alluded to. There are those who are near to the gospel. These are the semi-religious people. It would include your, your, your Roman Catholics. It includes your, your people who go to um, the cults, Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons. They, they think they have the truth. They think they know God. It includes Muslims even. They, they, these are the religiously close people to the gospel. And you would give them the gospel in the context of a message that is slightly different than giving the gospel to someone who has never ever heard of Christ before. And uh, so the, there, we have these two types of people. Those that are close and those that are far away from the gospel. Paul put the gospel into the context of the Jewish Jews' history, but when the Jewish leaders rejected them <clears throat> because it went against the peace of the community, Paul spoke to the Gentiles towards the end of chapter 13. But what did he do? He only quoted Isaiah 49, 6, telling them that the gospel was not exclusive to the Jews, but it was also for the Gentiles. Now look at verse 48. It says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the way of the Lord. And as many as were appointed, there's a key word, to eternal life, believed. Do you know what got them so excited? Because the whole time that they were in the synagogues, the Jews kept telling them, you got to become a Jew in order to receive the salvation. Now Paul says, uh -uh. The gospel message is for you as a Gentile. And so they believe. You know, you never know who God has called and prepared to receive the gospel message. Okay? We, we don't do the saving. God, that we don't do the saving or the convincing, only the witnessing. We don't have to convince people to believe. We just have to give them the gospel. 
Well, verse 50 tells us that persecution arose against them and they had to leave. <clears throat> Chapter 14 tells us that the witnesses, Paul and Barnabas, went to Iconium, another town. Uh, they were filled with joy at the number of new believers in Antioch, despite the Jewish opposition. So they, they were um, no doubt encouraged as they came into Iconium. You'd be encouraged too, wouldn't you? If people responded to the gospel through the that you had given to them. However, the Jews of Antioch followed them there. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 tells us that when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and stole them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So they ended up having to leave. And not knowing whether there were any converts there in Iconium or not. So when social pressure and, and uh, opposition came, um, they just moved on. And ultimately what was happening was, this is God in His providence using social pressure and opposition to take them to the next town where they needed to be. And this is what we mean when we talk about God leading our own lives. You don't have to stay in a situation that is difficult because you want to convince them. God may be giving the opposition to make you go to the next person to, need the, to get the gospel. Pray about it and God will of course direct you and lead you as to what exactly it is that he is having you do. So when they arrive at Lystra now, <clears throat> so they, they've left Iconium, they now arrived at Lystra, um, their ministry actually got off to a flying start when God healed the cripple. We see that there. And this, and this got everyone's attention, and Paul gave them the gospel. And sometimes God uses difficulties in individuals' lives to prepare them for the gospel. Okay? And well, we saw that with Jesus um, in many occasions. He would say, this cripple was born, this guy was born crippled just for this time when I would come to heal him. So that you would be able to recognize that God is in the message that I'm bringing. And so God uses circumstances in people's lives to, to make them um, available and open their ears to being able to listen, to, be, uh, to accept the gospel that we give them. Uh, other times it's national disasters or, or even horrific events like uh, the shooting in Texas or even the death of a loved one. These, these things, these circumstances that people go through, God often uses those to prepare their hearts to be able to receive the gospel. And He always brings the gospel to them. Have you ever noticed that? God's timing is perfect in people's lives. So God has moved them through Lyconium, where it seemed like nothing happened to Lystra, and now it seems like this is going to be a great place to minister. <laughs> Except there was a complication with the Lyconians. <laughs> Here's the complication. The city had a, um, a legend, an ancient legend, that Zeus and Hermes, who were... Greek gods, small g, that these two guys had uh, once disguised themselves as mortals and came to their town looking for a place to stay. They went to a thousand different homes and nobody would be hospitable to them at all until finally they came to this one place of an old man and an old lady uh, who opened their house up to them as humble as their dwelling place was and gave them um, lodging and fed them food. <clears throat> in the morning, they discovered out who they were, and um, and in appreciation, the two gods transformed their their humble abode into this fabulous, beautiful mansion type of a temple, and made them both priest and priestess of the place. And all of the other homes of those that rejected them these two gods apparently destroyed. So this is the, their ancient legend. These people from Lystra were determined not to make that same mistake 
again. And they thought that Paul and Barnabas were Zeus and Hermes coming in disguise once again. You see where we're going here? Okay, and when you read the, the text there, what did they do? They, they, they had a feast. They, had, they were honoring these guys as gods. And what happened was, is their presuppositions interfered with the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. It made it almost impossible for Paul and Barnabas to get the gospel out to them clearly. And sometimes we discover that our attacks are from the false teachers like Elimus, or they're from people who don't have their doctrine correct, mm -hmm. and sometimes it comes from uh, the social masses who want us to conform to their standard, and they see us as going against society, and they call us bigots, and they call us intolerant. But other times, it is the praise of the goats who want God on their own terms. Their religious presuppositions kept them from hearing the truth. And the temptation is, well, let's let them in. Let's welcome them in. And let's build these mega churches filled with goats <coughs> who end up mostly just putting these pastors on pedestals. Right? Did you notice that last Sunday that the massacre did not occur in a mega church with thousands of people, but in just a little tiny church of 50? The story of Lystra reminds us that in many churches the pastor is exalted above God and held in such esteem that people get lost in the culture and in the idolatry of the man rather than in God and the gospel. And churches and denominations that embrace culture and that embrace society norms, they make it hard for us to give the truth, but not impossible. Not impossible. Paul and Barnabas were faced with the temptation to accept their praise, so we do need to be careful with the praise of the world. This is another subtle aspect of our enemy. In, in this case, the crowd was enticed to turn to violence uh, uh, against Paul and Barnabas, uh, again, from the ones that came from the previous cities, the Jews. And they threw stones at them. They thought they killed Paul at one point. They drove them out of the city. In verse 20, they, it tells us they come to Derby where they preached the gospel, and they had great success. And we don't have a lot of information, but we do know that there was a revival that happened there. Uh, large enough that uh, they were able to establish a church and establish elders. And we need to understand that, that our responsibility is to be witnesses, to give the gospel. We are not responsible for the harvest. We are not responsible for the harvest. God is. He determines whether it is large or small or none at all. We're just the witnesses. We kind of had this discussion, uh, not this month, but the previous month at our past, Grace Pastors meeting. Um, and I was a little bit saddened by the way that the, the debate went, and I think he just sort of got off track and they didn't realize what they were saying, but, but it's because they wanted past, to encourage pastors to be more diligent in preaching the gospel in order to, for people to be saved, that they were almost saying that if there is not a revival in your church, then it is the fault of the pastor. They didn't quite say that, but they were almost saying that. And we have to remember that, yeah, I, I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm called to feed you with the truth of God's word. We are all called to share the gospel and be witnesses. But it's God who brings the increase. And God alone. We're not responsible. Interestingly enough, verse 21 tells us that the witnesses, Paul and Barnabas, they returned 
by reversing their, their steps. They returned to Lystra, then Iconium, and then to Antioch. And what did they find in each of those villages when they returned? They found local congregations. They found that, that the, <coughs> the church actually grew. What did Paul and Barnabas leave when they left those cities the first time? An example of what to do in Definitely an example. What was the example that they left? The gospel. The gospel. To give the gospel. And those people that believed, when you know, it, it seemed like there was no ministry, even in, the, in Iconia in particular, they thought, man, nothing happened. Hey! Did they go back through and there's a church? <clears throat> you don't know what how God will use the gospel that you have given to somebody. Mm -hmm. By the way, two years later, when Paul returns to Lystra on the second missionary journey, guess who he finds there? He thought nothing happened at Lystra. <laughs> He gets there and he finds a disciple named Timothy. He became one of the most effectual pastors in the first church, century church. 16 chapter 1, you will see it. 16 verse 1. Uh, in fact, listen to, listen to what Paul wrote here in 2 Timothy 3, 11, 12. So he's writing to Ti this Timothy. He says, My persecution and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. <laughs> Acts chapter 13 and 14, right? Which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. He's telling Timothy this. But it's worth it. It was worth it for me because God saved you, Timothy. It's worth it for you and I to just get the gospel out. When Paul and Barnabas returned home they, at the end of chapter 14, they told the whole church of their adventures, uh, how they fought the magician for the soul of Sergius Paulus in Paphos, and the king won him over, about the Gentiles coming to faith in Antioch, how they were booted out of Iconium and worshipped God as gods in Lystra, and then how they went on to Derby and they saw the great revival, and then as they came back through the towns, they found many believers and established churches with elders. The believers overcame the social resistance, and God brought the harvest, and their beliefs and their moral stand and their love for one another became the seed that the king used to build his kingdom. What the early church went through is very similar to us today. Jesus built his kingdom through them, and he is still building his kingdom through you and me. You see that? So five things came out of this. Number one, give out the gospel. Number two, know what you believe. Number three, defend when necessary. Number four, leave the harvest to God. Number five, share your experiences with the church. I think those are pretty good lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. And when I think of us, our future, and where God is leading us to, <clears throat> this experience that we're having right now, I think is going to draw us closer together. And it's going to be the it's going to be the very thing that, that God is going to mushroom when we get into our new community. And we're going to have the gospel to deliver and give to those that are near the truth and those that are far from the truth so that God can build his church. And we will share all of those experiences. And who gets the glory for it? God gets the glory. Because three weeks ago, when we looked at, I think it was three weeks ago, when we looked at uh, um, His glory alone, that's the bottom line. <clears throat> we want God to get the glory that He deserves through all. And all of this that, that we see in our society, in our country, in our, in our 
political parties and all of that stuff that 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 we we see as as just the lost world in their lostness. One day we'll all disappear, and all of the evil that we see that in our world will all disappear. All the heartache and the pain that people go through will all disappear when Christ comes back and he finishes building his kingdom in his timing and through his spirit alone, using you and I as his witnesses. Isn't that great? Yes. We don't have to worry about it. We, we pray for revivals, don't we? We, we want God to re revive. We, we would love it if God would use us to bring about revival. But that's not our goal. Just get the gospel up there. And I hope to be able to provide you with the tools to do that. Well, that's it. That's my message. And uh, uh, 